really hard to follow a talk like that. <laughs> um, but I have a minor role in this next presentation. Um, I get to introduce someone who I believe encapsulates the approach, the empowerment, and the generosity of participation that has driven, I think, the, the group with whom he works in Seattle and the rest of the country. And as a foundation, we've benefited from that and his experience and guidance um, as an uh, ambassador, an inaugural ambassador, I guess you're, you're now, um, we still call him Mr. Ambassador. But um, he, he really has um, touched on some of the things uh, and will touch on that today. And, and, and we're taking a different tact. We have no slides. We're going to have a, a brief introduction by me, and then I would like Mr. Dave Sherry to, to tell you how he's approached his diagnosis and the empowerment which has allowed him to, to live his journey and, and hopefully share the experiences that, that allow him to, to um, go day to day. But um, I was taking ample notes, Bray, when you were talking. This is my notebook here. And I was thinking about how each and every of these words um, typify Mr. Sherry. So, investigate, educate, advocate, communicate, reevaluate on where he was before, where does he want to be in the future, and lastly, participate. So, it's my great honor to introduce Mr. Dave Sherry. Thank you very much, Greg. That was a very humbling introduction. I, I appreciate it. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Dave Sherry. I am a pulmonary fibrosis patient, and I have no disclosures. So we have just heard three excellent presentations focusing on increased patient engagement in clinical trials, um, a viewpoint discussing the need for change in, in uh, endpoints, in trial endpoints, and the importance of patient-related outcomes. And, uh, and so for this last presentation of the series, I've been asked to give a patient's perspective on participating in clinical trials. Uh, since the theme is empowering patients to participate, I will primarily be addressing patients in the audience in particular those who have never been in a trial, and uh, also those who may be considering um, a trial for the first time. So I'll relate to you the experience I've had with three different clinical trials, what motivated me to participate in these trials, and, and what my expectations were um, f for, for getting something out of the trial prior to the trial start. And I hope uh, my experience will answer some of the questions that perhaps you have and concerns that you might have about participation in a trial um, going forward. So before I begin, though, I just uh, give you a little bit of my background. Um, I uh, live in the city of Snoqualmie, Washington. It's about 25 miles due east of Seattle. And I was diagnosed with IPF in 2006. Since that time, I've been the leader of a support group for pulmonary fibrosis patients in Seattle. Um, and uh, the, this particular support, support group is sponsored by Dr. Ganesh Rigu, who was up here earlier, the University of Washington Medical Center, and we also receive support by the, uh, from the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation. I've been a long time um, <clears throat> volunteer to the foundation and I've served on several committees as well as an ambassador. So my experience with trials started almost immediately after my, my diagnosis in 2006. Um, first, I was very fortunate that my initial diagnosis was made by a local pulmonologist who had actually been a student under Dr. Ragu and uh, to whom I was immediately referred. Uh, after my diagnosis. <clears throat> so after making uh, the referral, my pulmonologist uh, told me that Dr. Ragu was doing some work with a drug called perfenidone, 
uh, for the treatment of IPF and that he thought I might be a good candidate for this study. So during one of my first clinic visits with uh, Dr. Ragu, we discussed the possibility of me entering into this trial. Uh, unfortunately, due to some nuances in my, my particular diagnosis, I wasn't eligible for it. And so having been first diagnosed and had got my hopes up a little bit, I was obviously disappointed. I came to understand, though, that uh, a, kind of a building learning period for me on clinical trials, and uh, this first learning point was, well, there are exclusion and inclusion criteria. They may not make sense to me right now, but from what I do know now about trials uh, and how they're constructed, um, my experience back in 2006 was obviously something I just had to accept. So my next... Uh, Clinical trial opportunity came fairly quickly as the uh, medical center uh, the, w where my clinic is um, was a study site for a drug already approved and already on the market for the treatment of pulmonary hypertension. And uh, this study was, had the hypothesis that this same drug would also help pulmonary I IPF patients. So I was accepted into this study and it began after the study coordinator walked me through a very comprehensive information and consent packet. Included in, in that uh, long conversation was the study intent, the procedures, the risks, as well as the voluntary nature of the study and the right a patient has to withdraw at any time. Some kind of important facts, I think, that uh, need to be um, paid attention to as you go into a study. So this particular trial was a double-blinded, placebo-controlled study with one group of, of subjects receiving the actual study drug and the remaining group receiving the placebo. For those of you new to clinical trials, um, double-blinded means that the study sub, neither the study subjects nor the coordinators know exactly who will be getting the drug or who will be getting the placebo. And the reason for this double blinding is to eliminate any bias which could affect the outcome of the trial. One of the potential side effects for this particular drug was for abnormal liver functions. Um, consequently, every study subject was um, required to have periodic blood draws uh, to check for any issues. In my case, after a few weeks, my liver enzymes started rising. And in response, the uh, study protocol called for a decrease in the dosage of, of whatever it was I was receiving, the placebo or the drug. Um, <clears throat> and while liver, uh, high liver enzymes can be a serious health problem, um, the reduced dosage that I, I went to actually brought my mind down into an acceptable range. So what, what this meant to me at that time was it, it confirmed, at least in my mind, that I was getting the study drug. Um, and when I asked my study re, uh, coordinator about it, she said, well, I don't know if that's true or not. And uh, even if she had known, um, she wouldn't have been able to tell me anyway. And she wouldn't even, I, I just asked her, well, what do you think? And she said, I'm just not going to speculate. So the uh, study ended after me being in it for about a year. And uh, it was determined that this particular drug did not have any significant effect for the treatment of IPF. Lung functions were essentially unchanged. <clears throat> Again, I was disappointed, but I, I rationalized the outcome as uh, knowing that every, every step or every study that ended with a, a, a negative outcome was just one step closer to a drug that would eventually positively treat IPF patients. So my next clinical trial after that experience occurred in the year 2012 and on into 2013. Uh, keeping abreast of the drug development pipeline is something that I started doing frequently after my initial diagnosis. And in fact, um, this is something that I have found, uh, the, you know, keeping track of the drug development pipeline. It's something of a very high interest uh, amongst my support group members as well as other patients that I've come to know. And during one of my reviews of the clinicaltrials.gov website, a drug caught my attention due to reports that in a lab setting, 
um, some reversal of lung fibrosis had been noted. And so to me, that was a pretty remarkable finding. So I started exploring the idea of applying for this, this particular study. Uh, the study was a phase two open label where all subjects received uh, the, the, drug, the, the study drug ad administration. Um, the drug was actually administered through infusion every three weeks for a period of 48 weeks. Unfortunately for me, the nearest study site for this, uh, this trial was in Salt Lake City, which is about an hour and a half flight from Seattle. However, this study really interested me, and I, and I felt that it, it would be a really big step forward in treatment for IPF patients should it be approved. So I looked into the logistics and the cost of participating and decided to apply. The biggest factor that really influenced me in making that decision was, was that there was no placebo. Everybody was receiving this drug. And, and I also want you to keep in mind that this was year two, 2012, so at that time there were no other drugs yet approved for the treatment of IPF. So ultimately, I was accepted into the study. I began my every three-week flight to Salt Lake. The protocol included frequent lung function testing and, and high-resolution CTs. <clears throat> Over the course of my participation, I experienced no side effects. The informed consent did, did say there, there could be some. And my lung function tests remained stable throughout the course of the testing. So this was notable for me because prior to the uh, entering into the study, my lung function test had shown a slow decline. Uh, so I saw that again as evidence that maybe perhaps this, uh, this drug is slowing the, 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 the disease progression, at least for me. And again, at the end of my participation period, I um, asked the study coordinator, um, well, the, this, this drug is supposed to uh, be showing to reduce uh, lung fi uh, fibrosis in the lungs, I said, are you able to tell me what mine looked like? And, and again, the response was the same. Um, they not only didn't know, but they wouldn't be able to tell me if they did. Now, as an aside, unfortunately, or perhaps um, frustratingly, that this particular drug, six years later now, is still under development, and, and, and there's a phase three study currently being conducted. And I say this is frustrating um, because from a patient's perspective, not just mine, but I think many patients would agree with this, the time that it takes for any drug to go through development pipeline is just way too long. Um, the, the, approval, the, the development and approval process, I believe, is in dire need of improvement with reduction in both time and cost. Now, my last experience with a clinical trial result, resulted in my not being accepted, but it did instead change the direction of my diagnosis and treatment. If you're not familiar, the RAP study tested the hypothesis, hypothesis that IPF patients with abnormal reflux or GERD who had surgery to mitigate this condition would see a slowing or decline in, in the, uh, uh, or would see a slowing of the decline in their lung function. While being evaluated for this particular study, it was discovered I had a condition which I was told was an indicator of autoimmune disease. Uh, further testing confirmed that, and my diagnosis was subsequently changed from IPF to a uh, autoimmune connective tissue disorder. <clears throat> my treatment also changed. Um, including immunosuppressant and anti-inflammatories. And uh, since that time, uh, and that, that's been about five years now, uh, again, my, my lung function tests have remained essentially stable. So at this time, the, the point that I would like to make is one of the things that I think is a, a, a benefit from participating in a clinical trial. And that is, throughout the course of a trial, patients typically receive more frequent testing such as lung function tests, CTs, blood draws. And the primary intent of these tests are, of course, to record the result uh, or to uh, uh, have the patients uh, record these results uh, the, the, to document the condition of their lungs and uh, also ensure that the patients are not going through any um, adverse uh, side effects. But a secondary effect of the cre increased frequency of testing is 
A change in a patient's health may be, get detected earlier than usual, allowing for an appropriate, an appropriate adjustment to the patient's treatment plan. In my case, a trial-associated test resulted in a finding that changed my, my diagnosis and treatment, and again, which seems, uh, at least for me, to be uh, leading to a better long-term outcome. So revisiting the theme of this morning's session, empowering patients to participate, I think it's important to consider what motivates a patient to participate in a trial and also what the expectations should be for a patient um, entering into a trial. So beginning with motivation, I, I would ask the question, do patients enroll in trials for purely altruistic reasons or for the hope of receiving some therapeutic benefit? And I would think the answer for most patients would, would be that it's probably some combination of both, with a strong bias towards the hope of a benefit. That was certainly true in my case, and, and I think it's perfectly normal to have this type of, of thinking, um, this type of motivation, especially when you're faced with a life-limiting disease like pulmonary fibrosis. But I'll also say that I think most patients soon come to understand the, the need and the value of participating in clinical trials beyond what personal benefit that they might receive. Which then leads us to expectations. So first, it must be understood that a clinical trial is an experiment with no guarantees. If a patient enrolls in a trial with the expectation that they'll get better, they're setting themselves up for disappointment. Being realistic about what to expect is important. So why participate in a trial? Well, the National Institutes of Health offers these following points. First, you may get treatment, new treatment for a disease before it's available to everyone else. Now this kind of speaks for itself, but again, there's no guarantees. Second, you play a more active role in your own health care. And, and this point I can't really overstress. As a support group leader for the last 10 years, you know, I can attest to the positive effect patients receive by being actively involved in their own health care. And by this, I mean seeking education about their disease, not being afraid to have open and frank conversations with their health care providers, joining a support group, and yes, participating in clinical trials. The third point, which I've already really mentioned, is that participating in trials um, may provide you with medical care and more frequent health checkups as part of your treatment while, while participating in a trial. And lastly, you may have the chance to help others get better treatment for their health problems in the future. And this point actually comes up fairly frequently with, within our support group discussions. A great many of us patients have children and grandchildren. And some of us also have the familial form of IPF that affects multiple family members. All of us want to see a future where our family and friends will be free from worry about pulmonary fibrosis in all its forms. And clinical trial participation is a great way to help make that happen. But what it really comes down to is this. With no patients, there's no clinical trials. With no clinical trials, there's no new drugs. With no new drugs, there's no hope. So for you patients in the audience, if you have not yet enrolled in a trial, I ask that you give it serious consideration. And if you make that decision, finding a trial will be one of your first actions. It may be that your clinic is currently a study site for one or more trials. If so, then talk to your doctor for more information. If not, the, the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation website has a section titled Clinical Trials Education Center. And this is a great place where you can learn more about trials just in general find out what drugs are in the current pipeline, and, and even find a trial that is near you for which you may be eligible. The National Institutes of Health is also an ex excellent source for clinical trial information. I had mentioned it earlier. I think many of you already know it, but clinicaltrials.gov is a, is a bookmark you should have on your computer. 
The last point I'd like to cover this morning is to acknowledge what's already been said in the previous presentations concerning greater patient participation in clinical trials. Having patients involved in the entire clinical trial process from development to reporting is an important opportunity for input that could potentially mitigate some of the barriers that to participation, shorten the timeline for development and, and, uh, and approval, and, and hopefully reduce the, the uh, cost burden as well. As a patient, I hope to see further and aggressive movement in this direction. So in closing, I hope my experience with clinical trials has given you a bit different perspective on what they are and how you might see yourself participating in the future, both patients and researchers alike. I'd like to thank the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation for inviting me to speak with you here today and to all of you for your time and attention. Thank you very much.